Uh, the next session um, is going to be slightly different in that we're, our folks are going to uh, be speaking here from these chairs, and we're going to have some video rolling while we do it. Um, and then, then we'll have another speaker after that. And as before, then we'll have a, a little bit of Q&A. Um, OK, so we're ready to start. Do I just start the film? OK. Okay, hi, my name's Donna Hancox and I'm from the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia, and I'm presenting with Helen Clavey, who's also from QUT in Brisbane. And our presentation today is called Amplified Voices, Transmedia Storytelling in Communities. And the video, that's not... Oh, there will be a video playing in a moment. And it's just some um, photographs and video from the workshops that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so, so sorry. No, that's okay. Just get going. So while that gets going, the context of today's presentation is that in 2014, we, Helen and I at QUT, partner with Arts Queensland, and Arts Queensland's our state funding and policy arts body, and we partner with them and a couple of small to medium arts organisations, Queensland Writers Centre. Brisbane Writers' Festival and If Book Australia to yeah. deliver a series of events around the theme, Writing the Digital Futures. And there are a couple of different events that were involved in that. One's a large public event called Story Plus. There's some smaller events and experiments we did with If Book. But the most significant part of that partnership was to do a series of storytelling workshops in remote and rural Queensland. And today we're going to talk about those workshops and the ways in which a variety of media and narrative forms were utilised to create very simple, very small but unique stories that represented place and lived experience. And these stories fell, I guess, mainly under the banner of transmedia storytelling. So, keep going. Okay, so I'm going to talk for a little bit before we get to the workshops just about this idea of transmedia storytelling and why we chose that as a catch-all for the type of storytelling that we're doing. Um, why we chose that as a catch-all of the type of storytelling that we're doing. And I know that transmedia storytelling is kind of one of those contested and difficult terms that moves in and out of fashion. But for us it became a kind of useful phrase for us to talk to organisations and talk to government about the type of storytelling that we're trying to do in these communities. And as I'm sure most of you, if not all of you know, the term trans transmedia storytelling came into prominence via Henry Jenkins, um, who used it to describe a particular approach to storytelling that made use of the emerging media platforms that were being explored more frequently by everyday consumers, you know, in the early 2000s. And Transmedia stories can be experienced across a range of platforms or can incorporate multiple modes of storytelling on a single platform. So games, blogs, video, video, audio and text. And each of these come with their own language, their own values, their own strengths and their own limitations. So initially when you know, we remember back to the early 2000s and transmedia storytelling, the most pervasive examples of transmedia storytelling were big budget mainstream film and television franchises that kind of rolled out um, their marketing content on other platforms and hid it as backstory or some kind of extended narrative. And it was done in a way to maintain interest in the mothership narrative. You know, things like Matrix, Spooks, Lost. And these did harness the potential of telling stories across platforms to maximise audiences and profits. And for a long time, this idea of transmedia storytelling was the default ubiquitous understanding of transmedia. However, over the past five years, different types of projects that heralded an alternative deployment of the philosophy of transmedia became more commonplace. And, you know, they're hybrid in nature, and these projects were often independent and focused on telling small fiction and non-fiction stories outside of the traditional genres of transmedia. So for our thinking, transmedia storytelling is by its very nature multi-layered and dialogic. And as a means of creating and communicating personal narratives, the types of which we're going to use um, in the workshops that we'll talk about, 
It allowed for increasingly horizontal modes of authorship and a further dismantling of this idea of the expert storyteller or expert researcher going into communities to tell stories. So Donna and I had run um, a graduate class in transmedia storytelling for about five years, an interdisciplinary elective that uh, was offered across the creative industries. So it had um, art, media and design students doing cool projects together and experimenting with the form across platforms. And then before this current grant with Donna, I'd done a lot of work over the last decade engaging communities in place-based storytelling workshops such as um, oral history or making digital stories and creating exhibition style story pieces, particularly working in uh, rural communities that had been affected by disasters. So those that had um, been affected by floods or cyclones, for instance, where communities were looking to document and capture their own memories um, while they were still fresh in their mind and rebuild their communities and their lives, usually in that order. I also had previously had a grant where I had uh, worked with writers um, to do historical fiction and non-fiction short stories um, to create a place-based storytelling app called Imagining the City. Um, and these stories were geotagged and they had more layers of information that would open up for the reader to experience uh, when they were physically in the location of where the stories had been based. But all, the, all of these instances, we were working in a time where the web was not available everywhere and the services were too expensive and um, to, to assume that every household had them. So when we were doing writing the digital future, the internet had become such a better and more affordable service in rural um, areas, although it's still not perfect, and phone technology had become cheaper and easier for everyday use and every year it was getting easier and better to use and access. So we then had the means to be able to combine the use of oral history style interviews, digital storytelling, photographs, video, other ephemeral uh, objects together with um, other transmedia creative writing activities into one eclectic weekend of storytelling uh, that could be shared digitally and in different ways, in different formats and different platforms such as history trails, audio stories, for personal use, for community projects and exhibitions, on public sites, or to, ta uh, to share online, or to use such as through uh, social media platforms for just family and friend use. So I'm going to talk about the first two series of workshops that we did in 2014 and 2015 in two towns called Rockhampton and Townsville. And just Helen mentioned a moment ago about how these were shared. And a number of the stories and also the insights from the workshops have been shared in a number of ways in the past couple of years. So on the writing platform, which is an online journal that um, presents information for writers about technology, also through the social media sites of Facebook and Twitter that are associated with the Writing the Digital Futures grant and also some of the organisations we partner with. So the remit for the workshops was quite broad. It was everything from some educational, um, you know, education about digital writing to develop some skills and also to try and create some content as well. The workshops were all free. And the first town that we conducted the workshops in is Rockhampton. So Rockhampton has a population of about 74,000 people. Its unemployment rate is 9%, which is about 3% higher than the national average of Australia. And for young people, it's considerably higher than that again. And the workshops were designed to introduce residents to alternative ways of telling stories about their community and about their own lives, and ideally using unexpected forms and avenues that reflect the community and also them as individuals. And Helen and I co-facilitated those workshops with a writer from Melbourne called Matt Blackwood who specialises in location-based storytelling. The cohort for that workshop was a mix of young people and particularly young men who were really heavily into gaming and also older women who had very limited digital skills. The participants were less interested initially in the actual content of the workshops and they were in having something to do over the weekend in Rockhampton. They were just really excited about turning up for something free and just interested to see what happened. So to start the workshop we talked to them about how do you even structure a story. 
How do you identify the most important and compelling aspects of a story? And then we worked with them using everything from post-it notes, we're talking about lo-fi, really small stories, post-it notes, the books in the libraries themselves and social media. So to start off, we asked them to wander around the library and find a book, anything that jumped out at them, and then to use a post-it note to start writing about a character that came to them when they looked at that book and to stick that post-it note on the book for other people to wander around and find. Nearly always this character they wrote about ended up being themselves in some way. And that the idea for the story was triggered by the name of the book. So often it would be a crime or a romance book and they would imagine themselves in that and kind of try and imagine themselves out of their own lives. And once they had that character and they had that stuck on the book, they then started to take photographs and video around the library and outside the library to start developing that story and the characters further and sharing those photographs and videos over Facebook and Twitter with extra text as well. It was a really lo-fi approach, obviously, but it was inclusive and it started to really build con um, confidence in the ability to leverage diverse and everyday tools to tell a story in ways they hadn't really expected. And it was important that they were all able to use it. When Peter was talking last night about, you know, how do we empower communities to tell our own stories, you know, part of what came out of these workshops for us was that to empower people to tell our own stories was to really make sure that the tools were familiar and that the tools were usable and that, that anyone could use them. And that was a starting point. There was a familiar, usable set of tools for them to begin so they could move from that point onwards. And then the second town, which was a completely different experience, again, was Townsville. And Townsville's in far north Queensland. Um, it's a really particular region of Queensland. It doesn't really identify with metropolitan Queensland at all, and Queensland's a state where 85% of the population live in major cities. So far north Queensland feels very removed from metropolitan Queensland, is often referred to as the deep north. So we worked in Townsville with a digital, really well-known digital writer and theorist called Christy Diener to deliver a workshop, and this one was particularly about interactive and branching narratives. And the participants in this workshop were mainly middle-aged, they were a mix of men and women, and many of them had lost jobs in the traditional industries around Townsville, so mining and manufacturing, and were attempting to start their own businesses, things like cleaning companies, bookkeeping, gardening. And again, they were less interested in the content, um, and they were really interested in developing some skills that they felt might be transferable for them as they kind of tried to transition into a new, you know, new phase of employment in their lives. So in this workshop, we worked with them, we began to think about how do you design a narrative from multiple points of view and how do you choose different media for each of those perspectives. So we started off, we gave them the story of the three little pigs and we said to them, pick a different perspective to tell the story of the three little pigs and then choose a way to tell that story. So everything from a fake news account to a blog, you know, the Big Bad Wolf's blog. And then we also used Twine to, um, to create some branching narratives as well. And by doing that and teasing out which narratives work best for different voices and which platforms work best for different kinds of audiences, we then started to discuss with them the ways in which they could use these ideas to advertise and amplify their own business ventures, to amplify their own voices in a community that felt really lost and so in a real sense of transition. So those two first workshops really showed us that different communities and different cohorts required really different kinds of workshops and really different approaches from us. And we went in having an idea of what the workshop was going to be about and then had to alter and rework them, usually on the spot, to be relevant for the participants. And Aroma was um, the last workshop and that was the most conservative, um, that is the most conservative electorate in Australia. <laughs> And while the gun shop in the main street seemed to be quite busy, the rest of the regional uh, town and areas like it, retail and services have suffered um, greatly with economic hardship over the last few years. And so at the end of three and a half years, Roma was the last workshop weekend that we did. And uh, we were focusing particularly on creating good historical non-fiction and fiction, which... Uh, by its very nature, is um, nuanced with detail of everyday, seemingly ordinary lives. Um, I don't have anything interesting to share is what everyone would say at the beginning on every weekend we worked on, and Roma was no different. So um, 
uh, we had to work with people because after a, after a couple of ice breaking activities, uh, we could run a story circle and it would soon reveal that these rural folk had extraordinary lives and stories um, to tell and we had plenty of material to work with. We used the story circle to help identify a particular part of a participant's narrative so that we could say to them, let's focus on that part of the story in this workshop. And um, we had a mix of male and female participants. They were aged between about 30 and 75 years of age and are from very different socioeconomic groups. Uh, and they had very different uh, digital skills from none at all except being able to email someone. Uh, to being able to edit film on their uh, mobile phone. And each wanted to create a different type of, uh, what I'd call a different type of story product. Um, and as we found in the previous workshops, some wanted their stories to be made public, some wanted them to be digitally accessible, and uh, we had to think about suggesting the, the right platform for them, for the different purposes that they wanted to have them for. We had a grandma in the group who had um, a few photos on a USB, which she thought was very technical to be able to bring in with her. And um, you know, she was amazed when we showed her how she could use the photos and film on her mobile phone that her daughter had tech messaged her about her grandson. So uh, we had uh, another woman who uh, uh, had, had written a story out by hand during the day. She went home and she typed it up um, on her computer and um, emailed it to us as a story draft along with some poetry that she had been working on that she thought uh, after doing the first day of the workshop might be of interest that we might be able to use in the second day. And so we had an opportunity to start teasing out what people had to offer and that the skills that they had built in their own homes and in their own lives had, were able to be digitally translated. At the start of the project over three years ago, the digital skills of the participants and the connectivity of the community were still not mainstream enough for us to run a workshop like we ran in Roma. So uh, now, in this day and age, only three years later, uh, we have a lot better uh, flexibility to be able to individualise uh, each participant's experience in the workshops. And when we look back at those workshops and also looking forward to the workshops that will start running again next year, you know, we're realising that the capacity to create and understand and decode and enjoy transmedia style stories that stray away from mainstream versions requires a series of literacies for communities and transliteracies perhaps and also literacies for us as facilitators and practitioners and educators. And that these literacies arise as much out of, consume, out of doing as they do out of consuming stories and being able to apply the possibilities and tropes of stories that you know to your own circumstances, your own experiences, your location, your aims. And these literacies for us include the ability to work collaboratively, to understand and be unafraid of iteration and making mistakes, the capacity to work with unexpected situations, being able to discern meaningful stories from generic narratives, and for individuals and groups living in remote areas, being able to engage with a wider national conversation digitally and to contribute to the rep representations of themselves and their own lives is an important aspect of feeling involved and belonging and in, you know, included and feeling valued in their own country. And looking at the ways in which using a range of media and a range of narrative forms to create stories can work in these kinds of communities. It became clear that transmedia storytelling as an approach and a framework offers possibilities for otherwise underrepresented groups to harness these media and narrative forms to create stories in and about their own communities in ways that were shareable, that were inclusive, that were authentic and situated in their own lived experience. Thank you. Thank you.